Hey, good morning. Hey, if you are joining us on the other side of the monitor this morning, I want to say good morning uh, to you. Thanks for worshiping with us. Hey, uh, before I start, if I could just say a quick thank you. Each and every week, I can't tell you the hundreds of hours that it takes to uh, make the church go round, and I can't tell you uh, and thank God enough for how he has blessed this church with the volunteers that he's blessed the church with. And so every week, literally hundreds of volunteers gather, and they use their giftings to invest in the church. And so would you help me thank everybody who volunteers? Would you just give them a round of applause, please? If you are one of those volunteers, I just I want to just say a heartfelt thank you and thank you to all of our volunteers. Well, today, as you guys just saw in the video, we're beginning a brand new series, super excited about this series, and we're even going back to the Old Testament. We're going to look at this book called Ruth. Here's what I'll tell you. She's more than a candy bar. She's awesome. Like, she is one of the most fascinating books in the entire Old Testament. Testament. And let me tell you why she's fascinating. She shouldn't be there. Like she doesn't belong there and yet she's there. Have you ever played that game? You remember like which of these doesn't belong? Like you see 20 cats and one dog and you're like which of these doesn't belong? The cats of course. <laughs> but you had to notice like what doesn't belong? If you were to look at the entire Old Testament, if I was to ask you, hey, I want you to go through, I want you to see what God's doing here, which of these doesn't belong, after you came back and did a study, you would have to tell me, Ruth shouldn't be there. Why? Let me tell you why. She's not a Jewish. She's a Gentile. If you look at all throughout the Old Testament, what God is doing is he's establishing a nation through which he is going to bless all people. Ruth is all people. She's not Jewish. What is, what is, what is a Gentile doing in an Old Testament, Old Testament covenant with God? What is a Gentile woman doing there? Let me tell you what she's doing. She's pointing to God's ultimate plan. She's pointing to you. She's pointing to me. She's pointing to Jesus. She is pointing to Christmas. You see, all throughout history, going all the way back to the book of Genesis, God begins to drop clues that something bigger, better, more permanent is coming. And you had to be paying attention. And Ruth points to the fact that something bigger and better and more permanent is coming and she's pointing to Jesus and she's pointing that God's love is for each and every one of us. So every week what we're going to do is we're going to look at one chapter. We're going to look at one chapter and then we're just going to unpack that chapter and we're going to get ready for chapter two. She is a redemptive story but let me just give you a little bit of history before we look at chapter one. The book of Ruth actually takes place during the time of Judges. Now, Israel in the time of Judges is unlike any other uh, country. It's unlike any other nation on planet Earth at that time. You see, every other nation has a king, but Israel doesn't. But unlike every other nation, Israel has a God that is unlike any other God. He's actually true. He's the one. He's not false. And they have him, and they're supposed to look to him for leadership, for his, to him for provision. He's the object of their worship. He's the object of their affection. He's the one with all the authority. And so he makes a covenant with them. He makes a promise to them when he brings them in the promised land. He says, hey, here's what I'm going to tell you. He says, if you behave yourself, and if you worship just me, I will bless you. But if you disobey me, I will punish you. Not just to punish you, but to draw you back to me. And so here's what would happen. Is Israel, as God brought them into the promised land, they're like, Lord, thank you so much. And then they look around and, oh, we don't have a king like everybody else. We don't have, like, these idols like everybody else. And they begin to yearn for these things apart from God. And they disobey so God, true to his word, punishes them. And they say things like, man, Lord, I can't believe I did that. I'll never do this again if you rescue me. Have you ever tried to make that agreement with, with God? 
And how long did that last for you? For me, it wasn't even the end of the day and I screwed up again. But they make this deal, Lord, if you, if you protect us, if you'll come back, if you'll rescue us, we'll never do this again. So what does God do? He raises up what is known as a judge. And that judge comes and liberates them, protects them, frees them from oppression, and they go back to obedience. They praise God again, but then all of a sudden, back to the way that they go, and it just becomes this cycle over and over and over again. And that's what's happening. That is the context into which we meet Ruth. That's what's going on, and we'll see that in, in uh, chapter one. And so if you wouldn't mind, uh, please turn in your Bibles right now to Ruth chapter one. We're gonna read the entire, uh, the entire first chapter together, and here's what I'll tell you. Ruth is an absolutely fascinating story. But I wanna remind you, when I say the word story, you say the word characters. Don't do that in here, but I say story, you think characters. These people are not characters. Ruth is a real person living in real time, dealing with real issues. This is historically accurate account, and so it's great for us to be able to look at this together today. And uh, let's go Ruth chapter one. If you don't know where Ruth is, she's at more than a convenience store. She's in the Old Testament. She's near the beginning. So you just flip, flip to the beginning. This is kind of embarrassing for me. Should have had it marked. I'm gonna get there. Come on, Ruth. She's hiding. I'm almost there. There. There she is. All right, Ruth, chapter one. In the days when the Judges, that tells us what's going on in the history of Israel. In the days of Judges, and I'll just do my best to read through here, uh, and then we'll come back to it. In the days when the Judges ruled, there was a, in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in a country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. If you've seen The Lion King, you can remember his name. Elimelech, Elimelech. Okay, anyway, so sorry. Purge your mental banks from that one, man. <laughs> Cleanse the mental palate. The man's name was Limelech, and his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Milan and Kilion, and they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah, and they went to Moab, and they lived there. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. So they married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other named Ruth, and they both lived there for about 10 years. Both uh, when both uh, Milan and Kilian also died, and now Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to, two, uh, to her two daughters-in-law, Hey, go back, each of you, to her mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dad and to me. And may the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. She kissed them and they wept aloud. If you were to just read that one verse just by itself, it would make you laugh, but anyway. She kissed them and they wept aloud. All right, sorry. And then she said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you guys come with me? Am I going to have more sons who would come? Uh, am I going to have any more sons who would become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, and even if I had a, a husband tonight, and even if I gave birth to sons, would you wait for them until you grew up? Would you remain unmarried and wait for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. All right, there's enough people here that that may be a little bit confusing, and so let me just stop pausing the story for a quick second. In Jewish culture, in Jewish tradition, if you had many sons, obviously you were blessed. And if one of your sons died, if your brother died, it was men, it would be your job to marry your brother's wife. 
okay? That's what happened in ancient custom. If you had a brother and your brother died and he had a wife, it was your job right now to marry your brother's wife. Some of you are looking at me like right now saying, thank God I am not Jewish. Okay, all right. Okay, thank God that you're not Jewish because you would have had to do, you would have had to done that, and that's that's why Naomi's saying, "Hey, should I get married again? If if I get married again, I had a son. Would you wait for?" That's what's going on there. All right, let's keep going. At this, they begin to weep again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Verse 15. Look, said Naomi, your, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you, Naomi, or to turn back from you. For where you go, I'm going to go. And where you stay, I'm going to stay. Your people are going to be my people, and your God are going to be my God. Where you die, I'm going to die. And I, there I will be buried. And may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything, Naomi, but death would separate you and me. When Naomi realized that, uh, that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, could this be Naomi? So what there was happening is a huge celebration. And Naomi, total buzzkill, goes, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me, and the Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was just beginning. Okay, so hey, what do we know so far? Can we just throw that map up real quick? All right, so we know that there's Bethlehem. And there's Moab. It's a 30-mile walk. We know that Elimelech and his family made a 30-mile walk from Bethlehem to Moab. And here's what else we know. Just by looking at verse 1, we, says, we know that it happened in the time of Judges. And what was going on in the land? Something bad was happening. There was a famine in the land. And what that tells us is, it's a dark period in Israel's history. They're in a period of disobedience. They're disobeying God. And so what we know, because that famine exists there, that they are in a season where they're disobeying God. And so Elimelech decides that, hey, I'm going to move my family to Moab. And here's what I tell you. He is a God-fearing Jew, but it all goes back to this one thing. If we were to look at Judges, if we were to sum up the entire book of Judges, we could sum it up with Judges 21, 25. It'll come up on the screen, and this, this sums it up. People did what was right in their own... People did what was right in their own eyes. So that's what's going on when we see history taking place here in Ruth chapter one and there's, there's a famine in the land because they're doing what's right in their own eyes apart from God and God is punishing them in order to draw them back to himself. And Elimelech knows that moving to Moab is sinful because God brought them into the promised land with specific orders, with specific directives, with specific commands not to intermingle with the people. The only thing that would be worse than Elimelech moving his family to Moab would be his family marrying into the Moabite people. And that happens in the first five verses of the story. There is no way for us, for me, for you, for any of us here to fully appreciate the depths of the sin because a Jewish audience is looking at this and they're saying, he is moving to Moab? Don't do it. And then when his sons marry into Moabite women, I mean, you guys, they're like, they, a Jewish audience looks at this and says, this is sin of epic proportion. It's hard for, the empathi it's hard for us to empathize with this because we're not Jewish. We don't understand this. You just need to understand that this sin is a big, hairy deal, and it's really bad. But it makes me ask the question, why did Elimelech choose Moab? Why do you choose Moab? Well, if you look at Moab, Israel didn't really get in some big tangles with Moab. They were always fighting with, do you remember who they were? The Philistines. They're always fighting the Philistines. And so, it's, it's, so there's like a famine in the land and he doesn't want to stay he wants to move his family where he can provide for them. He knows it's going to be sinful, but he picks Moab because at least it's not Philistia. Now, here's a lesson. 
in that for us. Elimelech was justifying his sin. He was justifying his sin. He was saying, at least it's not as bad as these guys. Have you ever tried to justify your sin by saying, at least it's not as bad as? I could fill up a whole half hour talking about my brokenness. And we could fill up a whole lot of time talking about our brokenness collectively. Because each of us brought our own stuff in here today. Have you ever tried to justify it? Are you trying to justify your stuff this morning? So when I say your stuff, I'm talking about your sin. See, Elimelech's going to Moab. He's sinning and he knows it. He's just trying to justify it. Whenever we try to justify our sin, catch this, we're trying to do what's right in our own eyes apart from God. Whenever you find yourself trying to justify saying, well, hey, it won't hurt. It'll just stay here. It's not as bad as, let me tell you what we're doing. We're trying to do what is right in our own eyes apart from God. Bad things are gonna happen when we do that because disobedience never delivers on what it promises. Disobedience never delivers on what it promises. Listen, if you're trying to justify in your, in your own heart, in your own mind, if you're trying to say, hey, I'm gonna do this, here's what I'm telling you. You're being lured in there, but it's a death trap. It's not gonna deliver on what it's promising you. If you're flirting with sin, it's just a mirage. Listen, don't do what's right in your own eyes apart from God because it'll never deliver on what it promises. In fact, it will hurt you. Because you see, if you look at Elimelech and when he moved his family, we see right away, catch this, we see it right away, they went to move there for a time, which means he never planned on staying there forever. He never planned on staying there forever. He was just gonna be there till the famine ended and then he was gonna go back and everything was gonna be great. Well, hey, here's a great observation for us. None of us ever choose to stay in our sin for very long. It just looks fun for a season. We wanna go try it. We wanna go do it. Why? Because we wanna do what we want. We want the freedom to do what we want apart from God. And nobody ever plans on staying there forever. Nobody ever planned on getting in more trouble than what they did. They just planned on going for a little while and they stayed longer than they ever thought they would and the consequences were steeper than they could have ever possibly imagined. What I'm telling you is if you're trying to justify, really what you're saying is, I'm gonna go do what I want and I don't plan on staying here forever. Just plan on doing this right now. But if you find yourself in that season, what you're trying to do is you're trying to do what you want apart from God. You're trying to do what is right in your own eyes apart from God. And here's what I'll tell you again. Sinning, disobedience towards God never delivers on the promise that you think it's offering you. But here's the other, here's the other nugget of truth. Then don't miss this. is he justified his sin, he stayed longer than he thought he was going to, and his decision didn't just affect him. If you're flirting with sin and you're saying, I'll just be here a little while, it will never just affect you. It'll affect the people you love. It'll impact the people you love. People you love will pay the price for your decision. People you love will pay the price for your decision. Let me tell you about those people that you love. It's your moms, it's your dads. It's your grandpas, it's your grandmas, it's your spouse, it's your kids. Those are the people who are gonna pay the price because what we see is that, man, he made a bad decision. It was a really bad idea. And let me tell you why it was a bad idea. It'll come up here on the blank. It's a bad idea because we can't see the future outcome of our decisions or the impact it will have on us or the people that we love. Elimelech never went with the intention of staying forever. He certainly didn't go to Moab with the intention of dying. They left a famine and he left his family worse off. 
That's what happened. That's what happens when we try to justify our sin in our own in our own eyes or doing things what we think is right in our own eyes. That's what's going to happen. You can't see the future outcome. He didn't plan on it. And I bet if you were to look at your own life, you would say, I never thought that I would be here. I never planned on being here. That's because we can't see the future of the impact or the outcome of those decisions. And that's why doing what, doing what is right in our own eyes apart from God is just a really bad idea because bad things always happen. And what happens is he leaves his wife, Ruth, he leaves his daughter-in-laws with absolutely nothing. His sons stay, they marry Moabite women, they die while they're there. And these women are completely left on their own. And that may not make like a whole lot of sense to us. And so again, let me just fill in the blanks. Back in this day and age, women were like property. They didn't have rights. They weren't valued. They were just a spouse, somebody to help take care of, somebody to bear children, not somebody to cherish. And so, so when Elimelech dies, when her son dies, Naomi has absolutely nothing. She's in the twilight years of her life, and for her to go out in a field and to pick food is going to be very difficult from her. She's old, the energy level isn't there, and it's gonna take more than what she has to offer to go out into those fields. Her daughter-in-laws, they got nobody. And so she's saying, you should go back to your Moabite people because maybe somebody would marry you. Maybe somebody will help you start all over again and take care of you. She's like, for me, it's over. Nobody here is going to marry me. And she enters this season of grief. But it becomes more than grief. It becomes, their grief becomes her identity. Do you remember what happened when she came back to Bethlehem and everybody was excited to see her? They said, oh, look, Naomi's home. Do you know what Naomi means? It means being pleasant. That's what Naomi means. And what does she ask them to call her? Mara. Mara means bitter. So she's telling us that she doesn't just feel grief. She's identifying with grief. That's dangerous. All of us in here knows what it means to experience loss. We might experience like the loss of a dream. Some of you guys have this dream and it hasn't come to fruition or maybe it's beyond, uh, beyond able to happen and you look like the dream's over, the dream's dead and you feel a sense of loss with that and along with that sense of loss comes grief. Maybe, you, maybe you're working in a place that you didn't think that you'd ever find yourself working in or maybe what you find yourself is you lost your dream job, something that you loved. Man, it's gone, that season's over. We all know what it is to grieve, but Naomi took it a step further and said, no, I am grief. And if I could just, if I could just caution all of us, all of us in here knows what it is to grieve, but please don't ever, ever, ever let your sense of loss lead to you losing your identity, which is a child of God. We're all gonna experience loss, we're all gonna experience grief. But don't let that sense of loss lead to your loss of identity, that you are a child of God and that God is for you. For Naomi, she lost that. A couple years ago, we were talking about seasons of grief. And what I, what I encouraged you then, I'll encourage you guys today, don't ever wallow in your grief. You weren't ever meant to wallow, like stay there. You're meant to walk through. For Naomi, the grief was the weight of that grief was crushing to her. And it went beyond just a sense of loss. That loss became her identity. She's the type of lady that walks into the room, and before she ever walks in there, you can feel the sense of loss. She's the one who's walking into the room and that you know right now, just her being in that room changes absolutely everything, and you know that there is nothing you can say to make her feel better. Naomi walking into that room, she's the lady that, man, you start to avoid because it doesn't matter what you say, you know it's not gonna make it better because she has gone from grieving to becoming the identification and the personification of grief. And what I'd say is don't wallow. Listen, if you find yourself in a season of grief today, don't wallow in it. 
It's just a season. You see, when grief takes up residency in our heart, when it takes up a season of, uh, or when it takes up residency in our heart, in our mind, it is real easy to treat the season of grief as the sum of our life. And we were never meant to stay there. God will bring us out. But sometimes it takes taking a step of faith. And so if you look at the totality of the first chapter, it's a hard chapter because it looks like there's just doom and gloom. You've got this woman who sinned, her family sinned, and they're dead, and she's stuck in a land with no hope and no future, and you get to the end of Ruth chapter one and you're like, this isn't fun. I didn't come here for this today. Give me something I can walk away from, away with. It'll encourage me. Okay, I'm an optimist. You see, she did something that is so tiny that we just pass right through it. Something happened early on in Ruth chapter one that is absolutely pivotal in Ruth and Naomi's life. The reason we pass over it is, it didn't deliver immediate gratification. It didn't stop the heartache. It didn't stop the hurt. But here's what it did do. It positioned her life to receive from God. And so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you some optimism. I remind you, it's a redemptive story. And a redemptive story always starts out in dark and gloomy times. It always starts out in darkest days, but I want to remind you that, listen, God is in the business of taking our darkest hours and turning them into our brightest days, if we will do what Naomi did. Let's, let's put verse six up on the screen, because even in the midst of her grief, she finds herself in a season of grief, but what happens in verse six? It says, when she heard in Moab, because she's in Moab, when she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the of his people by providing food, we've gone from famine to now God is providing. So that means there's a season of repentance. God is, God is acknowledging that. He is coming, like the people are returning to God and God is beginning to bless them. He's providing for them. She hears about this in a foreign land and she and her daughters-in-law is prepared to what? They prepared to return home from there. Here's what I love that Naomi did. And it didn't pay immediate dividends but in the long run, it did. It was everything. She was able to hear that God is good in the midst of her grief. If you're suffering this morning, if you're a season of pain this morning, what I wanna let you know is do what Naomi did. Say, hey, just pop up from that grief even for a moment and realize that God is still good and he's still good to you. He still's good to you. She heard that God is good and then what she did was absolutely paramount, it's pivotal. She prepared to leave. She prepared to leave Moab and return. Let me tell you something. Ladies, you guys are gonna absolutely love this. Sometimes it takes following a woman's example to get things right. This is where you can, oh yeah, ladies, love it, man. Soak it up, man. Nudge the dude next to you. Just nudge the dude next to you. Sometimes it takes a woman to get it right. She prepared to return home. Can we just put that map back up here? See, when she left from Bethlehem to Moab, she had two strong sons to protect her and care for her, provide for her. And when she goes back from Moab to Judah, she's gonna go with one woman. I wouldn't make that walk today with two of the strongest guys that I know. I wouldn't make that walk. And I certainly wouldn't have been able to make that walk back then. It was a dangerous, treacherous walk for them. That was courageous. That was an act of humility because do you wanna know what she, ultimately what she was doing? She was turning from her sin and she was going back to God. You know, sometimes we have to go backwards in order for God to take us forward. And that is a big act of humility. It is courageous to humble yourselves in front of an almighty God and step into and say, Lord, forgive me, I screwed up. But she did it. She humbled herself and she turned around. She was turning back to God. In church circles, what we call that is repentance. It's turning from your sin and turning back to God. And that's what she did. And she had to go backwards in order for her, in order for God to move her forward. But she did it. And why did she do it? I'll tell you. 
It's the last blank on your outline. She did this because she believed that even because of that sin, she believed that God would love her and take care of her. She believed that God could do for her what he was doing for people back in Israel. She believed that with all that she was, and so she repented and she went back. She was willing to go back because she believed that God would do for her what God was doing for everybody else. When you look around and you see people, even in the seasons of grief, experiencing joy, experiencing peace, but you look at your own life and you don't have that, what it takes is a belief that God can do for you what he has done for others. God loves you so much he sent his son Jesus Christ so that you could live in freedom from sin, so that you could have life everlasting. Here's what I want to tell you. God wants to do for you today what he is doing for others. If you find yourself in a season where you're trying to justify your sin, if you find yourself in a season today that you find yourself in a season of grief, what I would tell you, what I would promise you is God wants to do for you what he has done for others, but here's what it's going to take. You repenting, turning from your sin and turning towards God. You see, Ruth is a redemptive story. It starts out not looking so hot, but then there's this little decision here that makes a big deal. And what, you remember when I told you that when you make a decision, will you try to justify your sin? Will you try to justify your sin and when you try to justify that thing and manipulate that thing and say, oh, it's not just as bad as... It doesn't just affect you. Well, listen, Naomi's decision, this decision to repent and turn back to God will not just affect her. You see, the positive decisions that we make have just, a big, just as big of implications as the negative ones we make. You see, when, Ruth, or when Naomi chose to make that decision, here's what happened. It impacted Ruth's life. That powerful decision is the reason that Ruth chose Naomi's people as her people. That powerful decision is the, is the reason that Ruth chose to make Naomi's God her God. That powerful decision to go and stay with her is going to play a pivotal role not only in Ruth's life, it's going to lead to a blessing for Ruth, but ultimately it is going to lead to a blessing for all of us. That simple act of repentance and turning from and going home. This morning, if you would turn from your sin and turn back to God, that is a decision that will not just benefit you. It'll benefit your kids, your grandkids, your future, your future generations. It's a big deal. Years ago, God blessed me with the opportunity to talk to young people. And I see young people out here today. And if you're a young people, meaning you're in your 20s or younger, what I want to tell you is sin looks enticing, but it'll never deliver on its promises. Don't try to justify it. Turn from it. Because that decision not only will save your life, it'll be good for your spouse and your future kids. But then there was this moment where God said, your days with young people are, old, are over. You're too old. You don't get them like you used to. So you need to go hang with people like you. And I said, cool. Because people like me, we're just still big kids. We just have more resources. And what I would tell you this morning is the same thing I would have told a teenager 20 years ago. God loves you. And he wants to do for you what he's done for others just don't be so doggone proud. Turn. But when you turn, turn back to him. And by turning back to him, the pain may not immediately go away. The consequences might not immediately end, but you will be in position to receive his provision starting with his love. Because I can promise you, he wants to do for you what he has done for others. He's just asking you to turn back to him. And here's all it takes. In the privacy of your own seat, 
Lord, in the privacy of your own heart and mind, Lord, I screwed up. I made a mess of things. Lord, I'm turning back to you. I need you. If you will make that turn and you will stay in that direction, you will follow him, he'll do for you what he's always wanted to do, for you to live in his love. Lord God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this, uh, this group, this body of believers here. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your love. Lord, as we go throughout this study of Ruth, as it points to your great love for us, as we see ourselves in this story, I pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ that more than anything, we would see that your love that had existed for us back then exists now. And I pray in the powerful name of Jesus who sets people free, that people would experience freedom in this moment for your glory alone, God. We say thank you for Christmas because without you, there is no hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, man, do it. Do it. Live in that hope, man. You, if we, here's what I'll tell you, and then go. You can go as I'm telling you this. With God, you might be down, but you are never out. Naomi was down, but she was not out. There is hope on the horizon. There is hope for you. All right, hey, have a great week. We'll see you next week.